Today's episode of the Gold Cast is sponsored by health. Not just health, but the return of the Gold Cast. We're back, baby. We are back. Not only are we back, but we are locked in and ready to go because the most boring part of the sports year is virtually done. And we are about to ramp up into the greatest sport of all time, professional American football. Let's go. And on top of that, we're sponsored by Health. Health. Because the 49ers are pretty damn healthy right now. And there is so much to get into after training camp. So much. I'm not even sure if it's going to fit in this one pod. But before we do that, Raymond, why don't you let them know where can they find us? You can like us on Facebook.com slash The Goldcast. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Or, I mean, Twitter and just Twitter, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the underscore Goldcast. And you can also subscribe to us via iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of The Goldcast. Raymond is the greatest fanalist in the game. He has his focus on so many things. And one day, one day, he will remember where we are located on the internet. It's, <laughs> <laughs> at some point, he will remember fully. But Ray, you're the greatest fanalist in the game. It's okay. Raymond, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter at Ray Solis and Instagram at Ray Solis one Boom. And you can find me at Rudy Solis 3 on Instagram and Rudy Solis 3RD on Twitter.com. Okay, this entire episode is solely dedicated to the 49ers because you asked for it. We are done. No more NBA crap. We are focused on football, on what this podcast was founded on. The 49ers, it is time. It is here. The NFL is arriving, and we are pumped and ready to go. But first, the greatest fanalist in the game is here. Your professor of fanalism is here. Class is in session. Let's go. San Francisco, are you ready? Are you ready? This is the Gold Cast. <laughs> Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Solis III, and with me is my brother, my co-host, Raymond Solis the First, baby. Boom! Man, Ray, it is, I'm not going to lie, I have been like the most spoiled child. I'm like Richie Rich. For all of our Gold Cast listeners that are over the age of 30, They'll probably know who Richie Rich is. For everyone under 30, they'll be like, who the hell is Richie Rich? <laughs> but uh, I am like Richie Rich a week before Christmas. I just, I'm like jumping out of my bones because all I want is for the NFL to come back. I want to hear Al Michaels, Chris Collinsworth. I want fantasy football. I want to get up at nine in the morning. I want to stay awake all day. I want to watch eight hours of football. I just want the NFL back and we are so close preseason is beginning preseason is beginning and you and I are those freaky guys that watch all the preseason I love watching the rookies don't you yeah I didn't used to be into it before but nowadays I'm into it just because we're we're so invested into the draft because the NFL has done such, done such a good job of marketing the draft and making it this huge spectacle that's you know outshines any other sports draft like baseball like i don't even know when their draft is or how it even works baseball know, sure. doesn't even know when their draft is yeah and and you know i know basketball's trying to match it with the lottery i don't quite get into that but i know it's it's obviously tailored and influenced by the nfl but the nfl's been doing this for years so i've i've definitely been been indoctrinated by the nfl and, and that translates all the way into the preseason because I want to see how these guys perform. Agreed. I love watching the Rooks. I want to see the kids. Our father, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but our father said something very, very wise one time to us. And this is why this is why you, listener, should watch the preseason. Our father said something. He said this. He goes, 
if you're really good at something in the preseason, if your team is really good at executing something in the preseason, then you have a shot at being at least okay in the regular season at that whatever it is you're executing. But if your team is really bad at something in the preseason, you are going to be horrible at it in the regular season. And I think that's very true. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so so don't suck in the preseason. Don't suck. That's all we ask. So let's get into it. Training camp, 49ers, so much to get into so much so let's 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 just do a let's do a little rewind let's go let's go back in the way back machine let's go into the time machine let's hop in the delorean and go back two seasons ago two seasons ago we're coming in to our new season we are fresh off of five straight wins with jimmy g right he just closes out that uh, 2017 season (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the years get so mixed in my brain. And five in a row, including the Jaguars, which I thought was our biggest win of that year. Obviously, that team was several plays away from getting to the Super Bowl and beating the Patriots. So it was a huge win, a team that I thought was going to destroy us. And the 49ers were kind of riding high. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hype Surrounding the Niners, a lot of talk about the 49ers going in and taking the NFC West single-handedly, easily. I mean, some pundits were saying. And the 49ers came in two seasons ago, you know, pretty confident, I'm going to say. I'm not going to say they were arrogant, but they were confident. And the way they ended the prior season, Jimmy G's first season when he was traded to the 49ers, it was like that these guys had it and they were going to make it happen. This was the coronation. It was coming. It is here. It will be here now. And then what happens? Well, here's what happens. First three games, the first two games, Jimmy G is looking pretty spotty. We get into this game with Kansas City where they are just kicking our asses. Jimmy G mounts a pretty big comeback and then non-contact injury, tears his ACL, he goes out of bounds, and then cuts to come back in bounds, which was perplexing, to say the least, and tears his ACL, and he's out for the season, and the 49ers basically just have a dumpster fire of a season, and it forces it forces this team to really evaluate what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. Raymond, give me your perspective on just that part, and then we'll move on to the next part, and we'll, we'll, we'll get us back up to where we are today. Well, health-wise, it's like it's, it's actually somewhat similar, but I just feel like there's a whole newfound perspective on health that the team has embodied since the last two years. You know, the last two years they had 41 players on injured reserve, which is astronomically high. Um, The entire roster of a football team during the regular season is 53 men. So, you know, do the math. You're you're down to, you know, a fifth uh, of your players or even almost even. Yeah, almost a fifth. So where they're at now, the fact that the two departments are now married together, they're now one cohesive department that has a very clear line of communication that flows between the two and that dictates how they handle practices and what, how the rest time is dictated there. Everyone is communicating with all of the strength and health coaches are communicating with the coaching staff. And then they're kind of then making executive decisions on how to schedule and format the practices and that even includes pads and whatnot, but all of, and then of course, there's a lot of stuff that happened, a lot of prep before, during, and after that is being dictated by all of these, this new staff. And so, I mean, last year they had six players on the PUP and NFI, NFI list, the PUP meaning physically unable to perform list, NFI meaning the non-football injury list. And that was uh, Jonathan Cooper, Trent Taylor with the back, Dakota Watson, Marcel Harris, Malcolm Smith, Contavious Street. Um, this year, 
it's just uh, Garrett Selleck with his back, Jarek McKinnon. He had a flare-up in his knee, and so they're just being precautious. Western Richburg and Jimmy Ward broke his collarbone. Um, poor Mr. Glass. And so, you know, but I think that the – because even though the new department, when players were being interviewed about this, they said that they didn't notice a huge difference. You know, it's just like – and it's because, you know, they're not involved in the meetings and the discussions, you know, about health, you know, they're just, they're given the, the end product and decisions that happen out after those meetings, that's what's given to the players. And so I think they're, they said they did notice that there's, it's, there's an open flow to the departments now, whereas before there wasn't. And I don't think the players notice the changes as much as, you know, the, the coaching staff and the, the act and the health and strength and conditioning staff are noticing but it does seem like there's also a kind of health perspective that they're all aware of. Because, I mean, you can't forget 41 players being on IR in two years. So I think that they realize that there's an expectation to take care of, better care of yourself. Because, A, that's the only way you're going to play is if you're healthy. And, B, that's the only way you're going to sustain a career is if you're healthy. So, and if you can't do that, then your career is going to be cut short, you know, and I think guys like Jimmy Ward are certainly going to fall into that category. I, I was convinced of that last year and they gave him another chance. And sure enough, he proved to everybody that he is very much still, you know, uh, trying to emulate Samuel Jackson's character from Unbreakable, uh, Mr. Glass. And he's doing an <laughs> excellent job of that. And I've, I've learned, um, that I'm not the only person that, that has given him that nickname. There's other people around the uh, media and podcasting world that also um, see him in the same vein. So clearly it's not a unique comparison to, to Jimmy Ward. It's a more of an accurate comparison. Yes. But I think, uh, I think the players kind of to wrap up, the players have really kind of done a really have embraced, you know, being more health conscious that not only do we see that as they head into training camp, but we also, they've, they've also kind of verbalized this through all the press conferences that they've had thus far. Absolutely. So let's talk about, let's talk about a little bit about that. The difference, I would say the difference between this year and last year, especially that perspective is health. Now, a couple of major changes. Lynch, once again, second year in a row, cleaned house. Got rid of the entire strength and conditioning heads, the heads. I don't know if he got rid of all the people underneath. I'm not privy to that. We don't fact check that kind of thing. That's not that kind of podcast. But uh, uh, one of the big changes they brought over Ben Peterson from the Philadelphia Flyers, who had a reputation. Obviously, hockey is a very – Philadelphia Flyers, a hockey team. Hockey is a very violent, violent sport, as aggressive, even more violent than football. I mean, these guys are coming at you you know, 10 to 15 miles per hour faster because they're on ice and on skates. And this guy's reputation for strength and conditioning for keeping teams healthy was renowned across the nation. And they brought in Ben Peterson and then they promoted Dustin Perry, who was already part of the strength and conditioning program the year before. And they brought him up. And between the two of them, Kyle Shanahan said things. They were looking at seven year charts, looking at data across seven years, looking at practice cycles, injury cycles, and showing, basically showing the coaching staff and the, the front office staff where these where these injuries and mishaps were probably maybe misconnecting or why the way they were approaching different things was probably promoting or uh, you know putting them in position to have more injured players and it sounds like everything's been really renowned and I will say this lead, that leads me into this there are three words that I take away from this training camp three words. That I think really embody the 49ers going into this season right now, going into the 2019 2020 season. Here's the three words, Ray. Number one, Ray, the first word is confidence. Once again, same as last year, I see a team that is very confident, that believes in their potential, that believes in what they're capable of doing, that believes that what they have put in place is capable of winning games and contending. They believe that. Confidence. That's number one. Number two. Number two is hunger. This team is hungry. 
they've had this two different seasons, two losing seasons. Last year they were they were everybody's dark horse. And then after Jimmy G went down, it just the whole thing went down in flames. But they were everybody's dark horse. This year, I don't think there are many people's dark horse. I don't think many people are super confident in the 49ers. I think the this year it's the Cleveland Browns, right? The Cleveland Browns is everybody's favorite dark horse. That's the team that's going to light up the scoreboards, light up the league. This is the team. The 49ers, I would say, were in the place of the Cleveland Browns a year ago, and now they're off everybody's ra- radar. Everyone's kind of forgotten about the 49ers. They're not really – I mean, I've, I've seen some ESPN pundits saying that they believe they're going to win three games this year. Three effing games. I can't believe that. I'm so insulted. That's a conversation for another day. But hunger. This is a team that knows the talk, knows what people are saying, and they're hungry. They're tired of losing. Shanahan is tired of losing. He has already set the culture. He said the culture has been put in place. Now it's time to win. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. Hunger is the next word. The third word, and this, I think, is a direct result of Jimmy G going down. And this is the thread. If you look, go back and look at all the press conferences. There's so many great ones on YouTube right now of everybody. Go through the press conferences, and here's the underlying thread. of Underneath confidence and hunger is this third word, humility. This team is humble. They understand that at any moment, they're one injury away from their entire season derailing. This team is humble. There's a humility here this year that I didn't see the year before. I, I wouldn't say that they were arrogant going into last year. I would never say that. Not even close. Not even close. The 49ers, no. Not even close. But I would say there was an aggressive confidence. Would you agree with that phrase? An aggressive confidence going into last year's season? I would say so. I, think, I mean, with, with good reason. With good reason, 100%, with good reason. But this year, I would say there's a humility because their mortality was tested and was shown to them. And I think that this team is hyper aware of what they're capable of, but they're also hyper aware of how fragile the structure is. What do you say to that? What what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that those three words embody the 49ers going into this season? I think absolutely they do. That's what we've seen in the interviews. That's what we're seeing a little bit in these first three days of training camp, unpadded versus padded. Uh, it's all, it all kind of looks the same to me. Granted, it's obviously a little bit more physical with the pads on, but in terms of how the players are carrying themselves and how they're conducting themselves in the post game, in the post practice interviews, it's very, very consistent across the board in terms of being confident, being humble about it and being focused, you know, and then, um, what'd you say? Humble confidence and the other one? Confidence, hunger, humility. Hunger. Yes. The hunger. Yes. The hunger is there for sure. It is. Uh, it is. Let's get into the press conferences because there was a lot to unpack. Oh my God. The press conferences were so revealing. And I think there's none more revealing than the Kyle Shanahan John Lynch press conference where they specifically address the two articles, the one from Bleach Report and the one, I don't even remember where, what what news source it came out of, that basically talked about the discontent. The Matt Miller the, report. Yeah, the, the frustration between Lynch and Shanahan, the, the disruption in the front office. And we talked about this on the podcast, Matt Mayoko – brought that writer on and that was the most aggressive I'd ever heard Matt, Matt Mayoko pretty much was like I don't see that anywhere remember that do you remember that remember when he talked yeah. on that and we talked about that on this podcast I was like go listen to Matt Mayoko because Matt Mayoko was like straight up going like it was the most aggressive I've ever heard him he was like I don't and even even in the bleacher in the in the bleacher report article they referenced the Matt Miller report but also said that they had not had any whiff of such a rumor with any of their sources uh, for 49er news. So clearly Matt Miller is a privileged guy that just has this really shitty source. (laughs) Yeah, basically. And when Mayoko shot it down and we addressed it on this podcast earlier in the year, that was enough for me because Mayoko is there every 
day. He has been with this team forever. And, you know, we often tease about how vanilla his podcast is, but it's, it's, it is the only 49ers podcast where you can get the straight shoot on everything. Would you agree with that? The straight shoot. Yeah. From the source. He doesn't play any games on that. And they addressed it. And the, Shanahan basically talked about how they knew they kind of hinted at they knew exactly who it was. They were glad that that person wasn't in the office anymore. And they also said that at the end of the day, this comes down to those two guys. These two guys. It is it, Ultimately, this entire team falls on their shoulders. And if you didn't like how that's set up, he said back when he was a controller, he talked about when he was coming up through the ranks, Gruden wouldn't always accept plays that he gave them. He's like, that's just how it goes. So this falls on their shoulders. It doesn't fall on any scout shoulders. It falls on their shoulders. And I love the fact that they addressed and squashed the rumors about there being this dissension amongst the front office. What did you think about that part? Because I thought that was the most important takeaway above everything else. As far as the off season, that was the biggest takeaway. That to me was like what I wanted to hear. Because there's not a lot of – as, as – Shanahan and Lynch both addressed in the same press conference, there's not a lot of leaks in the 49ers, not under this regime. Under the Trent Baalke one, yes. And I think, you know, the more drama and turmoil a franchise undergoes, the more leakage it starts to have. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like when, when a when a house gets old and you don't stay up on the maintenance and you don't you don't keep the, the property um, up to date properly, you start to have problems, whether that be electrical problems or plumbing problems in this case, leaks. That stuff happens if you don't take care of the house, you know, or metaphorically speaking, you know, if you don't take care of the team. But this team is, despite all of the adversity and hurdles they've experienced the past two seasons, is well kept. It's well groomed. Everybody respects one another. Everybody's, it's a very tight group, despite all of that. So kudos to the to Kyle and John to a little bit lesser degree. I think the coaching aspect is definitely more, um, you definitely hang that hack on Kyle and his ability to kind of keep him and his staff and to keep everything together, despite all of the unfortunate injuries that they've had to deal with that's kind of derailed ever, ever that's derailed progress of other players and derailed the progress of the team and being able to gel and play together more consistently as a unit but as far as the rumors were concerned that part was my favorite part because it was like hey you know what I, it, and you know what the funny thing too is it, in the bleacher report article they talk they're referencing this guy this disgruntled scout and not once in the article did this source, this disgruntled, this disgruntled scout, ever give his opinion on who he would have had want them to take versus the player that they didn't that they ended up taking. You know, I love know. this observation by you. Expand yeah, on this. This is the best observation. You're the only guy that's dropped this. Drop this on the gold cast. I love this. This is the best to observation. Me, to me, it like blew my mind. I was like, because that's what. I, as soon as I kept reading it, I was like, oh, so this guy didn't like the picks. I was like, okay, well, I'm curious to see who he would have picked because I wanna, I wanna see who that player is. You know, I wanna go on whatever team that player that they didn't pick ended up on. I actually wanna go research that player and find out who it is, and come to find that this scout never offered his take on who he thought they should have picked instead of the players they picked. One pair, player that was referenced was Joe Williams. We all know that Joe Williams didn't work out. Um, Reuben Foster didn't work out. We get that. But um, but I was like, okay, well, if you're not going to give an opinion on who you think they should take, then why the hell are you complaining in the first place? Not not You're complaining about something that you didn't even – you know, maybe he did, uh, but to me, it seems like a no-brainer. If you're going to be so bold as to talk about, you know, your former employer and things you didn't like about it, they didn't have the guts to do when you were there, then, or maybe you did, because I think, because, I mean, Kyle and them, you know, know who this person is. It's only one person that's no longer on the team, and they think that, they said that everything that, that's come out, uh, the, the the criticism that's come out from this person, they know exactly who it's from. They definitely, they, they definitely know. I don't know yeah. who it is, but they Shanahan and Lynch, they they know just based on the look on their faces during their press conference, they know who this guy yeah. is. And so it's like, all right, well, 
then you've got no goddamn foot to stand on because, you know, unless you're going to offer your two cents, then you just need to provide your scouting reports of all of the players that are in consideration and then let the coaches make their decision based on scheme and all that kind of, and all that other kind of, you know, technical stuff that leads them to the decisions that they make, you know, and obviously none of them are going to work out. No team in the NFL is perfect at the draft. That is an, an impossible task that will we will never see happen where every single draft pick works out. It just doesn't happen. There are years where there are multiple ones that do work out, and that's great, good for those teams, but it's really, really hard to do. You know, but we can't even say the Patriots. That, even, I, yes. I've listened to a whole podcast that talk. Excuse me. T- talk about the podcast. Uh, I've listened to a whole podcast that talk about the Patriots, like last five or six drafts, and how almost everybody they they got was a bust. It, it it isn't. It's not. It's not unique to the 49ers. This is. It's a crapshoot all the time, all the time. Go ahead, continue. Yeah. So that to me, I was like, all right. I was like, this is like the most. This is the most uncredible guy ever. I was like, not only is he mad because they picked players that he didn't particularly like, but he didn't even offer an alternative pick in this inner in this bombshell interview that he that he gave or this bombshell you know conversation that he had with Matt Miller. So I'm like, this is this. He me- he, didn't, he didn't sit there and go, okay, we're in the we're in the war room, and I said y'all should pick up. I don't even know Deshaun Watson. You, you guys should pick up Deshaun. I think Deshaun Watson is who should we get? And Shanahan and Lynch were like, no, that's a dumb idea. We're getting X player. You know, like they, there, there was none of that. And I think you, you're the only person that observed that, that he never once said anywhere in this interview who he said that they apparently had denied. What, what amazing player was, was, was he trying to get this team to pick that they completely overrode him on? He never once mentioned that. Nothing. And no. if, the, if, if the, the, reporter, the, only- the reporter didn't ask that. If the reporter asked that, that's stupid on the reporter. But that that's a whole different conversation. Like, how do you not that, ask that? To no. me, I didn't. I didn't see nothing. You know, from my recollection from the article, didn't seem to be any kind of. There was no indication that the reporter asked that, or if it was, it wasn't included in the article, and there certainly wasn't anything written about this this uh, former scout giving his alternative pick. The only thing that was alluded to was that may I think some of the staff wanted or this staff member wanted them to, you know, give more consideration to Quillen Williams. I don't but that that was that was what was said. It didn't say you should pick Quillen Williams over Nick Bosa. It just said, you know, give him a little bit more you know, give him more consideration before you settle in on Nick on Nick Bosa. Can we, who by can the we, way I think is gonna be a day one impact player. Hundred percent. Can can we talk about the one thing? So, if you haven't looked it up, check out the Bleach Report article. Ray, do you know what the title is? Look up that title if you don't know it offhand. The title for the Bleacher Report article that came out last week. the The one thing that drove me nuts about that particular article is that it oh it's oh it's called Can the Forty ers Handle the Pressure? That's what it is. But it's a big Bleacher Report article. And they talk about in the very beginning of the article that the 49ers passed up. I'm pulling it up right now. They they passed up. This is exact quote. This is the duo that passed on Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, and Mitchell Trubisky. And thus... The chance at building an insta dynasty. I want to unpack that because that's one of the dumbest sentences ever written in a football article of all time. <laughs> and you, you know, you know. First of all, the the first thing I I told you off air, um, which I'll repeat here, was that you said, "Hey, did you read the article?" I said, "I did." And I said, did you read it? And you said, oh, I started it, but I haven't finished it yet. And I said, well, I can tell you uh, from finishing the article that um, it sure as hell, if you're looking for, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, what's uh, Bill Simmons' website? I always forget the name of it. The Ringer. The Ringer. The Ringer. Thank you. 
I was like, if you're expecting the ringer or, you know, the old or old Grantland quality sports writing, um, you're not going to find it here. <laughs> he did say uh, that. You're not going to find this is and no offense to Tyler Dunn, you know, I'm sure Bleacher Report is a great company to work for. They, they make a lot of money. The guy who originally meant it, uh, made that site, I think sold it for like 30 million or seven, seven or 30 million or something like that. A lot of money. He did. He did well. But the point <laughs> is, the point is he, he offers this quote, but doesn't give his reason why, why these players would make it an Insta dynasty. He just, he just throws out this insinuation with no backup at all. Now, to be fair, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, and Mitchell Dubisky all made the Pro Bowl last year. In fact, Patrick Mahomes was the, in my opinion, like the really big time, big time Pro Bowler last year because that guy threw for 50 touchdowns. He really thrived under Andy Reid's um, system. You know, he he can also sidearm and, and underthrow. He even had the no look pass. I mean, he's he's done some really impressive things at the quarterback position. And I'm curious to see how he's going to do this season because he's lost uh, some big weapons in the offseason to controversy. And I'm just curious to see how he's going to adapt. I think he'll be fine. But, I mean, okay, Patrick Mahomes, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Insta Dynasty we're talking about. Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson's dealt with injuries. He did make the Pro Bowl last year, but I think a lot of that was also due to... Also tore his ACL, like Jimmy Garoppolo, in his first year. And Mitchell Trubisky. Mitchell Trubisky really put up modest numbers because they're... He's not... Mitchell Trubisky is not necessarily... In my opinion, you know, we'll we'll have our our Chicago Bear uh, fan on, you know, sometime during the season to talk more about this. But in my opinion, Mitchell Trubisky... They're playing to his strengths, which aren't that great of strengths, which is why their offense wasn't very explosive. He threw for 24 touchdowns, 12 picks during the year. I mean, that's kind of more like that's – like, that's like Pro Bowl impressive for the 80s, not so much the 2000s these days. And no offense to anybody in the 80s. It was some, there were some 49ers quarterbacks that had numbers similar like that and made the Pro Bowl. But that was a different era. It was really, really hard. Um, much more difficult to, to get balls out than it is in this era, and so and but but to be honest, the the reason why the Bears are the Bears are the is kind of the, the easiest one to pick on because the Bears are very good for one particular reason. They made a really big bombshell trade to get Khalil Mack, and he's the one that turned the franchise around. He's the one well, that and made he's them paired an with Vic contender. Fangio, the best defensive coordinator in the game. And the only reason yes. we know that's because he was on the 49ers, and he's probably the number one reason we went to the Super Bowl. Not because of Greg Roman, because of uh, Vic Fangio. Right. And so that defense carried that team, not to the same degree as the year they went to the Super Bowl with the uh, atrocious Rex Grossman. I think Mitchell Trubisky is more talented than Rex Grossman. But um, that's the reason why that team contended. It wasn't because Mitchell Trubisky is an insta dynasty quarterback and carried the team. No, that team was very much defense driven. You look at their look at their schedule, look at their win loss record uh, over the course of last season, and you'll find that they only had a few blowouts, um, and most every other contest was decided by you know a touchdown or less. Um, and that's because they can't they can't outscore you. You know, and the the games that they did outscore opponents, I think some of that was also because of uh, defensive turnovers resulting in the touchdowns. But um, that one's the easiest one to pick on. Deshaun Watson, it's like, hey, that guy suffered a big injury too, and he's all right. I think he he runs a lot. Mitchell Trubisky and Deshaun Watson ran a ton um, last season too, and so that's not a big component that Kyle Shanahan is 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 keen on for as, as far as quarterback play is concerned. He very much likes players that stay in the pocket like Jimmy Garoppolo. Patrick Mahomes did a good job of that. You know, he did move when he needed to move, but he also did a very good job of getting the ball out. He didn't rely on his legs as heavily as Deshaun Watson and Mitchell Trubisky do because when you lack, you know, the arm, or I shouldn't say the arm because they both have good arms, but when you lack the passing proficiency of a Patrick Mahomes or a Drew Brees or an Aaron Rodgers, then you do tend to lean on your other assets to get you by. Like Colin Kaepernick had an arm cannon, but wasn't the most prolific passer. 
you know, and so he did have to rely on scrambling to get by. You know, Steve Young was obviously different where he relied on that in the beginning, but once he kind of settled in and honed his passing skills, he became one of the very best uh, to ever play. And before Aaron Rodgers was the most accurate passer in NFL history. All right, so check this but, out, though. Hold up, Ray. I'm I'm a, I'm gonna drop the mic. That was eloquently stated. That is, this is why you're the greatest analyst in the game. But I'm a, I'm gonna drop it even easier. This is why that's the dumbest statement of all time. And the second I read that in the Bleacher Report article, and if you haven't read it, go read it. This is why this is the dumbest, one of the dumbest statements I've ever read in an article ever. And that's not a hot take. It sounds very hot takey. I'll tell you why it's so stupid. Because Raymond, in order for those three guys to qualify for an instant dynasty, they need to have achieved a dynasty. None of those guys have won even one championship. One championship. We don't, we don't, b- between those three quarterbacks, we don't even have one championship. So what do you mean insta dynasty? An insta dynasty, as far as I remember, what is it, Raymond? Why don't you tell the audience? Because you love to tell this, and I think you're right. How many championships do you have to win, and, what, and how long of a period? You need three championships. Minimum of three. In? In at least five to ten years. Thank you. That's a dynasty. You know what's not a dynasty? Losing in the playoffs. That's not a dynasty. Yeah, not neither, a- neither of these quarterbacks have been to a, a Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes did get to the AFC Championship, but we all know how that turned out. All of them lost in the post. That's not a dynasty. An insta-dynasty, first of all, isn't possible because you can't be an insta-dynasty. Even if yeah, you win, Houston's been a one and done. How many years in a row now? They're Thank they're you. kind of they're like the they kind of remind me of the Cincinnati Bengals in that regard. You you can't be an insta dynasty because a dynasty requires you to win at least three championships. So don't tell me in your article that they passed up on three players that would have given them an insta dynasty because those three players haven't achieved an insta dynasty anywhere in the world on any team. <laughs> yeah, there is no such thing as an insta that's, dynasty. That's, that's impossible. That's, <laughs> that that by virtue of its of its of its phrasing is impossible and these guys haven't even won one championship. It'd be different if Patrick Mahomes had a Super Bowl right now. He'd be like, "Well, I mean, may, maybe Patrick Mahomes, he doesn't have a, a Super Bowl." He was on the best regular season team from last year. There's no such thing as an instant dynasty. You can't instantly win three championships. Yeah, and, and Deshaun Watson, like Mitchell Tabrisky, also was very much carried by that. Houston, the Houston Texans have had a terrific defense for numerous years now with J.J. Watt and uh, Devion Clowney um, over there on the pressure side and also in, the, in, in their secondary too. And they have carried, they've been, you know, a top 10, top five defense for multiple years. And that's what's carried them to the playoffs with the fact that they, why they haven't been able to get over the hump is because their offense is just not very prolific. And if you shut down one or two aspects, then, you know, they're, they've only got one great receiver, a decent running back and then a, a scrambly, you know, kind of erratic quarterback. So outside of those things, if you you force the quarterback to be one dimensional, i.e., throw and take away his running lanes, and then you just double team his number one receiver, then there's not much they can do. So uh, so it's not there's again Deshaun Watson rides the heels of the defense more or less, doesn't have a lot of weapons to work with, and if you take out the existing ones, he's he can't he can't he's not able to pick you apart. Same with Mitchell Tabrisky. Um, they run more than they pass, or I'd say they rely more on the run to set up the pass because without that, they cannot, they cannot just, they're not like the Patriots that can just abandon the run and just beat you in the air because they're the, because Tom Brady's so good at reading defenses and, and uh, threading seams. I don't even understand passing. how Mitchell Trubisky was even placed in this category. Patrick Mahomes is the closest it's thing because of their draft. It was draft. like and Patrick Patrick Mahomes is the only one that that's like, all right, I'll give you a little bit of of credit. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know feed into. He's not an insta dynasty, word, but I will give you credit for Patrick Mahomes because that de- uh, of these three teams, this th- this was the one team that had one of the worst defenses in the NFL. But for whatever reason, Patrick Mahomes went out there and balled his ass off every single game. 
so so let me break this down. There's this great, there's this very famous scene from a very old film from when we were kids. So it was very famous when we were kids called Wayne's World. And in Wayne's World, Wayne, played by Mike Myers, has a girlfriend. She was in Men in Black 3, very pretty lady. She looks pretty goofy in this movie, very pretty in Men in Black 3. Looks pretty goofy in this movie. And in the beginning of the film, she, she for his birthday, buys him a gun rack. To which Wayne famously utters, the famous quote if you've seen the movie, I don't even own a gun, let alone many guns that would necessitate an entire rack. <laughs> okay, you remember that line? Yeah. Okay, this is what I would say about all three of these quarterbacks. I don't even own a Super Bowl, let alone many Super Bowls that would necessitate an instant dynasty. Okay, we don't even we don't even have enough Super Bowls here, but amongst the three of them, to even have one dynasty, an instant dynasty, that drives me crazy. Can you hear my brain exploding on the mic? I'm like, there's no such thing yes. as an instant dynasty. You have to win three. These guys haven't even won. What the fuck is the point of this fucking yeah. article right now? What the fuck is the point of this stupid ass sentence? I'm really sorry for all your pa- all your parents out there. Tell your kids, I apologize, but. This earmuffs. Is some, earmuffs. This is some fucking bullshit. This is bullshit. An instant dynasty. I yeah. I, the only thing that the only thing good that came out of the article was all of the Richard Sherman quotes. Um, because Richard Sherman is a just he, he's going to give you so many so much good stuff to work with in his interviews because he's so articulate. He's very intelligent. He's very confident, and he's not afraid to to say it to tell it like it is. And so that's why you're always going to get that. He was the best part of this article. So if you do, if you guys do, I know we're bashing it, and so there's not, there's not a lot of good reasons to read the article. But the one good reason the, the of the few that exist, it's the the inter, the the feedback from the players, mostly Richard Sherman, which kind of alludes to what we the 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 points that we've already been hitting on early on with about the confidence, the humility, and of course the pressure and the the kind of the hunger, not the, the hunger, yeah, not the pressure, but the hunger. He he kind of redundantly puts pressure, pressure, pressure throughout the entire article, uh, very unnecessarily, um, almost like how Quentin Tarantino put the N word in to Chango unnecessarily. It's kind of like that same uh, excessive amount. But um, the point is that these guys are hungry to win because they've been denied the win by, you know, either self-inflicted wounds or just, you know, ill-timed injuries, of course. And so now everyone's kind of ready to just say, all right, fuck it. Let's just put it all together and start to put put this thing, put this whole project together the way we intended to a couple years ago. A hundred percent. And yes, you you actually stole the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, you know, there's three words that really embody Richard Sherman's uh, presence in that article. And I would say it was confidence, (laughs) hunger, and humility. Those are Mm -hmm. the three words. But I think the big takeaway, Gold Cast Nation, 49er faithful, is that there's no such thing as an instant dynasty. That's the stupidest phrase I've ever heard invented, ever. (laughs) Yeah. There's one thing you can get from this entire pod. (laughs) There's no such thing as an Insta Dynasty. God, if there wasn't so many other things we were talking about, that would be the title of this podcast would be There's No Such Thing as an Insta Dynasty. Yeah, he, he really lost me there. He really <laughs> did. It's, 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 and it was so early on. One, what, so what early on in the article, too. God, <laughs> I was, was like, oh, God. I was like, oh, now, now I really know I'm not reading The Ringer. This is how I really know I'm not reading anything on the Ringer. Yeah, no. The Ringer's the Ringer's a great website. That was the stupidest thing ever. Uh, let's Let's talk about... One of the, the the MVP, and then we've got to leave it here because we've already been running super overtime. The MVP of this, of all the press conferences that came out of training camp, the MVP has got to be D Ford. He was the best. Yeah, he's got a great. If you guys haven't seen the press conference he gives, it's it's short. It's only like you know eight or nine minutes, but it's great. Um, it's so know, good. It's, it's, you know, it's funny because I was really dying to see Nick Bosa's feedback, and I did watch the Nick Bosa video, but gosh, Nick Bosa, man, he's like even more vanilla than Matt Mayoko. Um, wow. This kid. <laughs> this kid. Uh, you, I like He him. has to be. After those I, after those Instagram posts, he has to be. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's like his, his personality is clearly, you know, very, very calm, mild-mannered, very monotone. Um, he loves football and 
you you can you can you kind of get that out of you you definitely get that out of him but at the same time it's like there's no that fire he saves all of that fire for the field so i mean that's that's it's some people like can you know can still have that fire on and off the field like a richard sherman d ford kind of smooths yeah, so out let's go that back fire to d ford. And, yeah uh, give me your d ford take yeah d ford he's great he's he's smart he's funny um he's very he's quick-witted um, he has great responses. It's just a great interview. I love it. was the first one I watched coincidentally because I was like, oh, D Ford, this is, yeah, this is our pro bowler. This is our pro bowler who's not injured, you know. He's it's a pro bowler who's not injured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to see what he had to say. And I was like, this is a great interview. I was like, oh my God. I, it's, I, I actually watched it more. I watched it a uh, couple times. Um, I did several too. Times, I did too. It was, it was more that than entertaining. Any of the other interviews. Yeah. He's so funny. He's, okay, so. For the Fortnite Faithful that haven't seen this yet, in fact, I'll throw a link in the description of the podcast. So I'll throw a link up so you can see it. D Ford was so entertaining. He was hilarious. He was, you know what I love about D Ford, Ray? Is that he, he has this like calm confidence. He's like, I'm a bad mo effer. And I know it. I know it. You know it. Marcellus Wallace knows it. Everyone knows it. I, <laughs> I'm just a bad dude. I don't need to prove it to you. I know it. I've already proved it. I'm gonna prove it again this year. He he was talking about Mike McGlinchey, and then he said that Mike McGlinchey is gonna have a much easier time on Sundays now that they're almost done with training camp. I love that. I love that mm-hmm. dig. That was great. They asked him who is the best tackle in the game. He said Joe Staley. Then they asked him uh, if you couldn't say Joe Staley, who would you say? And he was kind of a lo- at a loss for who the next name was. And then a reporter said. Mike McGlinchey, and he goes, my guy, Mike McGlinchey, that's who I'd say. And then everyone started laughing. That was great. Uh, tell them about the, the, the Staley track comment. That was really funny. The track and oh, yeah, because he was giving a lot of accolades to Joe Staley, who he also played last year in week three where Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt. He also talked about Jimmy Garoppolo and, set, and gave him praise that he was really good. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spoil that one for you, but you guys should check out what he says about Jimmy Garoppolo. But it, and Joe Staley... He was talking about just how good of a tackle he is. And they said, oh, did you know that Joe Staley was also a track star in um, high school? And he's like, I did not know that. And they said, well, were you able to, are you able to tell, you know, from the way uh, you've played, what you've seen by playing against him? He's like, I can now. I can now. <laughs> and everyone started <laughs> laughing. He was great. I instantly, like, that was the moment I go, I'm in love with this guy. This might be my favorite defensive player, and he hasn't even played a snap for us yet. I was like, just yeah. off this interview, I love D Ford. D Ford has the he has the potential to be the the most loved player off this defense, off that press yeah. conference. I, and I, in I, terms of talent, uh, Greg Papa, who's who's also had a press conference video, which was very entertaining to watch too, because he breaks down players and schemes like a pro. So it's it's never a dull moment with Greg. Um, he and he's with us now. Yeah, he described D Ford um, as he described his speed, compared it to Derek Thomas, the famous um, linebacker from Kansas City, and also Lawrence Taylor, um, one of the greatest linebackers that's ever played uh, for the New York Giants. So that was that's pretty. You know, I don't think Greg Papa. Greg Papa doesn't give out you know friendly, legendary comparisons like that lightly. You have to earn it. Yeah, so that's saying quite a bit. Um, and if and if you guys were wondering about training camp, you know, um, it's been mostly defensive. The, the defense has kind of kind of stuck out throughout these three days. It's only been three days, so take it with a grain of salt, you know. But um, it's 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 been quite a bit. Nick Bosa got a strip sack off of uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. DeForest Buckner picked up two would be sacks. This was non padded. Um, our Eric Armstead. And Julian Taylor flashed in the backfield. Solomon Thomas um, stood out against the run, getting tackled TFLs. Um, the offense did get some stuff done. Jim McLaughlin threw a 70-yard pass for a touchdown today. That was awesome. Um, day two was Eric Armstead, who blew up the backfield in 11-on-11 drills and forced Jimmy Garoppolo to get an incomplete pass. DeForest Buckner, Captain Lewis uh, Moore, Constavious Street also had would-be sacks. So DeForest Buckner's had three sacks in two days. Uh, the defense got the better half of the offense on Sunday. However, they did make several notable plays. Garoppolo hit Dante Pettis on a comeback route against Akella Witherspoon. 
I'm going to just focus on the starters here. But um, let's see. Uh, Akella Witherspoon jumped her out and got a, an interception. Richard Sherman got a pass breakup off Marquise Goodwin. Jason Verrett coming off of an injury also forced a fumble on a pass from Nick Mullins. So, I mean, the defense is really kind of all over the place. They're ball hawking. They've gotten, like, a, I think, like, about three turnovers in three days. So they're definitely getting after the ball. And so that was really good to see. And I, it, barring any injury, if this group stays healthy, you know, they're going to they're gonna be, in my opinion, completely different from what we saw last year. A, they'll be on the field is, is what I hope. And uh, B, they're going to – all the, the shitty stats that we put up, the historically shitty stats that we put up, put up last season and even some of the season before, all that's going to be the complete opposite. Raymond, you know, do, the, the, do you realize that DeForest Buckner is going to have D Ford pro bowler on a horrible Kansas City defense? Still made the pro bowl. He's going to have D Ford on one side and then rookie sensation Nick Bosa on the other. Yeah, My and, God. Yeah, going kind of going back to D Ford. They asked him. They said, you know, we we know that um, you know having DeForest Buckner on the inside, you know, can helps you out, helps you, you know, gives you more opportunities to be successful in your pass rush. But what do you offer, you know, for DeForest Buckner playing on the outside? What do you provide to help him? And D Ford said, pick your poison. Pick your poison. If you're the quarterback, you want to step up in the pocket, and get hit by him, or do you want to sit back and let me come around and strip strip sack you? You know, because if you don't do that, Nick's coming around the other side. So pick your poison. <clears throat> and you know what, Ray? We're gonna end on that note because I think that is gonna be the title of this week's gold cast. 49ers training camp, pick your poison. Any final thoughts, Ray, before we wrap up? I'm glad football's back, and I can't wait for uh, the preseason, which is going to start shortly. Uh, this next, we enter August in two days. That's right, baby. I'm with you. I can next month. I cannot wait. My anticipation level is reaching like five year old Christmas, <laughs> Christmas Eve levels. I'm I'm so ready. Uh, I'm so excited, and I think the potential for this team is astronomical. And I just want to quit talking and get to winning. So uh, I'm very pumped. I know you are pumped too. Go and go down the comments on youtube.com slash the gold cast. Let it know. Let us know what is your favorite takeaway from training camp? What is your favorite takeaway from training camp? Let us know in the YouTube comments. We'll talk about it. We'll blow it up here on the gold cast in a future episode. We will be back later this week to talk with our boy, our favorite new co-host, Mr. Candlestick Will, and we will be discussing the epic rise of the San Francisco Giants. You got to understand, we did not win our annual title this year, and right now, the SF Giants are making a run, a run for that wild card. And so we're going to talk with Candlestick Will. He's going to be back later in the week. We're going to discuss all things Giants Next time we're back, we are the only Bay Area podcast that is dedicated to all three major teams, the 49ers, the Giants, and the Warriors. We are the one podcast you can go, you can get all three of your favorite teams right here on the Gold Cast. So concludes another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the Voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Cease III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Solis the first, baby. Boom! We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time, same gold cast channel. This is, is the gold cast.